Hello everyone, I'm here to tell you about my work at JP Morgan looking at low rank topic models to solve an enterprise data management problem. First, a disclaimer this is not investment advice. If you lose money from this talk, I am not responsible and neither is JP Morgan. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about a simple hypothetical scenario that illustrates the problem that we're going to solve. Suppose I'm a sysadmin and I have two databases, A and B, that store account data about accounts and transactions, respectively. So the accounts database has one table called accounts. It has columns that are called account ID, date, first, last, account balance, and so on. Similarly, for transactions in system B, there is a transactions table. It also has an account ID and a date, but it has different information for the other columns. It has a payee, an amount, and an account balance. Suppose we now inherit a new system, system C, that has no documentation. We don't know whether this is an accounts database or a transactions database. In fact, we don't even have a name for this table, but we do have names for the fields. And some of these look familiar based on what we see in A and B. Now, the problem here is, can we use this information, the fact that we see names in common for the fields of the table, to give a label or a probability of having labels for this system? More specifically, if we look at the pattern here, we see that the table in system C has a first and last, which is similar to the accounts table. It also has an amount in payee, which is similar to the transactions table. And it also has an account balance and date, which is common to both. So how can we possibly use this information to make a prediction as to whether or not this is an accounts database or a transactions database, or possibly both? First, we encode this into a matrix. Uh, those of you who know me, I like matrices. Uh, this is a very nice way of thinking about the data in an interpretable manner. And we'll come back to that several times about understanding the interpretability of what we're building. So to, to construct this data matrix, what I've done here is collect all the information we have about these semantic tags and also the names of the tables and fields that we see. So here we see that system A has the accounts tag, but not about transactions tag. We have a table that's called accounts, but not a table called transactions. And we have columns that have these names that we see. We put them into a matrix. That's the matrix we get for this particular system. Now here you see that I've encoded the absence of the transactions tag as a question mark rather than a zero. Now this is up to this particular use case that we're looking at. If we know for sure that system A is not about transactions, we can set this to zero in our data matrix. Otherwise, we can leave this open and blank and maybe we'll have a machine learning model help us figure out what this should be. So this thing is what we will use to create what is called a labeled topic model. And here the word labeled refers to the fact that we have these semantic tags, the accounts and transactions, that tell us something about the semantic information, not just the physical information about where the data is laid out, but also that the fact that a human has gone through and labeled this particular database as being about accounts and another one about transactions. If you repeat the process for all three systems, this is the matrix that you get. Again, we've left some of these as blanks in, in the forms of question marks, and we're asking the machine learning model to help us figure out what we should assign. Is it a zero or is it a one? And with, if so, with what probability? Doing so will answer the original question of what labels we should assign to system C. So first, let's go through SVD's base methods. The basic assumption here is one of what we call low rank structure. So in specifically, we think of the matrix as being well approximated by another matrix of the same size that is exactly the product of two matrices, each with k rows. Why this is a good assumption in practice is debatable, but there is some theoretical justification, for example, in the paper below, about why this would be the case for real-world data. For now, we'll just assume that this is one of the basic structural assumptions of the data and proceed from there. Now, once we have the SVD, one way to construct this factorization is to effectively split the difference between uh, of the singular uh, values on the, both the left side and right side pieces. So if we keep only the top few singular values, we can imagine constructing now 
the X and Y matrices that effectively have well-known rank of at most K. Now this method, using the exact definitions of X and Y above, is known as latent semantic indexing. And this is one of the famous methods that made the SVD so popular in the natural language processing field in the 1980s and 90s. What does this look like for our toy problem? These are the X and Y matrices that we get. Now we see here that there is some distribution of numbers that tells us something about the likelihood that one particular set of features will co-occur. So for example, we see that transactions table positively correlates with the amount column. So when you see a transactions table, the data says that this also co-occurs with the amount. Now what is less clear is how to interpret negative numbers that look like this. Um, there is a probabilistic representation in terms of a Gaussian prior, which we will not go into into this talk. But nevertheless, it's really hard to think about what exactly this means, and this requires further transformation of the data that we will not cover. We've talked about how it's hard to interpret negative coefficients, but actually, to me, the more insidious problem is actually the fact that we don't actually know how to label the rows. We're taking the row of x and its corresponding row of y to interpret that as a topic, and, and this is the topic that is part of what is called topic models in NLP. But we don't really know how to interpret them. We have some clues here because we have the semantic tags, the accounts tag, and the transactions tag. But they occur in these quantities that we don't really understand how to deal with. In particular, if you di discard the magnitudes for now, <coughs> it looks like one is the linear combination of accounts plus transactions, the other one is the combination of accounts minus transactions. And, and it's really this minus combination that really breaks our intuition for what probability should do. Probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. What does it mean to have a negative probability? Now, this is clearly not a probability. What exactly this number is, um, it's not really that clear. So these are the several disadvantages of the LSI method. Now, if we go back and look at the structure of how we've com uh, composed the matrix factorization, it turns out this is not the only way to construct some pr product of matrices X and Y that reproduce the SVD. In particular, you can multiply X by any invertible matrix and Y by its corresponding inverse, and this still gives you some way to represent the SVD. We call this the LSI with generalized gauge, where the matrix M is the gauge for the transformation. The name gauge comes from uh, uh, physics that we don't really need to worry about at this point. All that you need to know at this, for, for, for the purpose of this talk is, is that you can multiply X and Y by arbitrary pairs of invertible matrices and the corresponding inverses, and you still get a well-defined factorization. With that in mind, we're going to make a very specific choice that looks like this. Now what we're doing here is effectively breaking up the V matrix here to correspond to the columns that represent semantic tags and the columns that represent semant semantic features. So that's what the V sub T is. It's just the part of the V matrix corresponding to the semantic tags. And the F part is for the features. Now, if we make this very somewhat odd looking choice for X and Y, we see that Y has a very interesting structure here. In particular, we see that there is an identity matrix component, and then there's like the everything else matrix component. And we'll use this to our advantage to assign an interpretability to the topics that we get from this model. For a more concrete uh, look at this, this is what we get for the toy problem that we get. What we see here is still the presence of some negative values, uh, which we are still not quite sure how to interpret. But what we see here is that we now have a way to assign interpretations of the rows. So in particular, we see that the, the tag label only occurs in the first row, and the transactions tag only occurs in the second row. For this reason, we can assign that this entire row here represents the topic corresponding to accounts, and similarly, the second row here corresponds to what we label as the transactions. The X matrix here gives us some distribution of the frequencies and, and probabilities that we see the topics in the three different systems that we have. So let's try to remove the last issue of negative values. So it turns out that both the LSI and the LSI with generalized gauge are special cases of the generalized low rank formulation that was presented by Madeleine Udell in last year's Julia Kahn talk.
Now, the general formulation is to say that we th frame the training of this matrix decomposition as the minimization over this particular loss function. Although it looks a little bit scary, uh, it's not to worry. What we're saying is that every single element that is reconstructable from the data matrix has this corresponding loss function which describes the values of x and y that are taken and we also allow regularization terms to prevent overfitting. Now for labeled topic models, the particular case we're going to study, we make some particular choices. First of all, the element-wise loss is not the Gaussian, which is actually the case for the SVD-based method, but instead it has this logistic penalty function. And the logistic function gives us a way to get interpretability that we'll explain later. On top of this, we add some regularization to promote sparsity. Uh, this is the famous L1 term that allows us to uh, give a penalty for magnitudes of the data matrix that are too large. And finally, we add also what is called a diagonal dominance constraint. So we, w we like the identity structure because that's the thing that gives us interpretability uh, in terms of the semantic labels, but we don't want it to necessarily have the exact identity. So this is the relaxation that we call diagonal dominance, which is just saying that the diagonal entries are still the largest in the matrix. Here's the algorithm that we compose based on the uh, thing, pieces we've seen so far. So we construct the truncated SVD. We use that to construct the LSI factorization with generalized gauge. And we also do a, a, a numerical trick, which is randomized subsampling. And then finally, we feed this to the low rank topic models uh, that, and for training. Before we go into the details, let's just look at the results. For this toy system, we have this particular factorization. We still keep the fact that the first row is primarily about accounts because this is the largest of the two. And that similarly, we see that the second row is still mostly about transactions, but not exclusively because the tag here is still the largest, but there is a negative component here. Now the negative components still exist, but we have a way to interpret these now. As it turns out, uh, the way we, sh we should think about this is that these are effectively logarithmic odds ratios. And if we invert them back into probabilities using the logistic function, this gives us the answer to the original problem that we wanted to solve. In particular, if you look at the results for system C, we see that there is a 77% probability that system C should be about accounts, and also a 91% probability that system C is about transactions. And this solves the original problem. Now let's talk about some practical implementation details, in particular randomized some sampling and some simple uh, changes to the code that we made to make it run on Julia 1.0 and beyond. So first, randomized subsampling. If you look at this expression, uh, we haven't quite fully discussed this. This is a summation over every single observed entry of the data matrix. Now, if this was a fully observed data matrix, this would be a very, could be a very, very large computation involving many, many terms. The trick here is to realize that you can get away with sampling just a small subset of the observed entries. And in particular, there is a theoretical reason why this particular quantity should be bounded below by this number. Now, this number looks a bit mysterious, but it actually relates to how many parameters of the singular value of decomposition can be freely varied without breaking the SVD structure. So effectively, this is the number of parameters needed to characterize the manifold of matrices of exactly rank k. And that is what is described in this particular review paper below. Uh, we'll refer to you to that for details. For now, we look at what actually happens in practice when you try to use this uh, to sample, uh, to subsample the training problem. So what we see here is that what we want to get to is effectively the value on the right over here, because if we sample every single entry of the, da of the data matrix, then that's where we want to be. So this is the region we want to be in. And it turns out that there are these transition regions and this region of overfitting if you have extremely, extremely small values uh, of, of, uh, that are actually sampled. Now, the theoretical uh, minimum number, which we saw on the previous slide, is represented here in purple. Now, what we see here is, is that, well, almost in the well-fit region, but not quite. Whereas if you go to just twice that or four times that, 
you know, quite comfortably over the hump of the unstable transition into this well-fit region. Now, this, this particular behavior has been observed before in the literature. Um, it's not fully understood why 2x or 4x is the right multiplier here, but nonetheless, we will take this empirically as an observation of what we can get away with in terms of simplifying the computation needed for this problem. Now to talk about the code aspect of what we've changed, it turns out that very little needs to be changed for this problem that's not already implemented in low rank models. Now the main thing here is to implement a new proximal gradient descent step to implement the diagonal dominance constraint. I won't talk about the details of what that means here, but really just to mention that the matrix updates involve some sort of convexified gradient descent method and the proximal operator is the thing that gets you back onto the right constrained set of possible solutions. The details, of course, are found here. Uh, we won't talk about that uh, for now. And that's really all we need to do. Like multiple dispatch handles all of the uh, overloading necessary to define proximal gradient descent uh, simply by defining the right parameters in GLR. Now to make the code run on Julia Post 1.0, turns out that there are only a few things that need to change. Uh, in particular, we just add some very simple support for missing values, namely that they contribute nothing to the loss function and also to the gradient of the loss function, which is perhaps not surprising. But also, we, also, we turn on multi-threading, as is done in the Julia uh, 1.3 uh, multi-threading model, simply by adding the add threads macro to this for loop. And with some rearrangement of, of the computation in between, this gives us embarrassingly parallel multi-threading to update rows and columns of the matrix uh, in all simultaneously and in a thread-efficient manner. Finally, we'll look at practical results on the Kaggle data set. Now, Kaggle is perhaps a uh, very well-known repository of public data sets. Here, we're looking actually as not at any particular data set on Kaggle, but rather the entire inventory and catalog of data sets itself is the data set we're going to look at. So this data set contains an inventory of over uh, 25,000 data sets. There are 857 labeled subjects, and we have some physical metadata about the names of files and names of columns that we see in the data. So just like the problem that motivated us from the beginning, the task here was to evaluate if we could predict semantic tags, which are namely these subject labels, from the physical metadata that we observe based on the file names and column names that we see in the data sets. Now, if you look at the details of what you can scrape from the public API, um, you see many indicative examples that, uh, of, of data quality issues that we see in real life as well. In particular, we see missing topic labels. For example, this particular data set has no subject label, which is why we are embarking on this problem to begin with. But also that the features are not necessarily very indicative or, or semantically meaningful. Like, you know, what does nq.csv really mean? We're not really sure. Things like close, high, and volume, okay, like th these are very suggestive. These, these are probably something about finance, uh, but we're not sure what these are. And data.csv, test.csv, train.csv, these are completely not semantically meaningful. They're just very, very generic. Nevertheless, we will try to make the most of what we're seeing. Uh, one of the things we will do is regularize the problems to throw away some of these uninformative features and try to focus on what's left behind that looks like it has some sort of predictive content. Now we'll look at three particular topics that have come up. Uh, here is a common label, which is finance, which occurs in 655 data sets. What we see here is the Y matrix from before, but now a visualization thereof. So we see here that the finance tag correlates positively with law and government, transport and video games for some reason, and it negatively correlates with law, online image galleries, and universities and colleges. On the right-hand side, we see that the, the presence of a column called year, a presence of the column called project is approved, and similarly for age, city, and project title, these are all positively correlated with the presence of the finance tag. Conversely, we see that day, sex, target, and so on 
are the names of columns that most strongly correlate with the absence of the finance tag. And what, we, what we've left out here is effectively everything in between from the top five and bottom five. Um, it's, it's probably somewhat interesting that, the, that we see things like projects show up as correlation to finance. Okay, maybe that's not super semantically meaningful. Uh, let's look at another example for astronomy. Uh, astronomy seems to be a topic that occurs mainly by itself. Uh, there's not much positive correlation with other tags, so it doesn't really co-occur with any other subject label. Now, what's interesting here is that the top five most predictive column names have names like body, gravity, something that looks like acceleration, something that looks like jerk, and something that looks like X, Y, and Z coordinates. So it's quite promising that the presence of these column names are suggestive of the presence of maybe some sort of astronom astronomical simulation or observational data. Finally, we see a topic belonging to a very rare label, which is cardiology in this example. Now, cardiology um, seems to correlate with country, location, state, city, and price. This might be indicative that the cardiology data sets may be something about cost and location of cardiologists, possibly. Uh, it's not entirely clear. Uh, and it's also not really clear why this would correlate with linguistics or language resources. Uh, this could be overfitting. Maybe we should regularize all of these away, but nonetheless, this is what you see based on the data and parameters that we have uh, chosen so far. So in summary, a simple gauge transformation of SVD-based methods gives you a way to unambiguously assign semantic meaning to topic models in a way that is not generally done. If we relax the stringent matrix structure that we have imposed, we can express the resulting problem and solve it using the generalized low rank models framework of lowrankmodels.jl. Uh, very simple updates to the code uh, make it run efficiently using Julia's 1.3's multi threading model. And the results on Kaggle.com metadata that we saw earlier so promising interpretability. I'm making no claims that the analysis is correct, but this hopefully convinces you that a very uh, simple matrix factorization based approach to analyzing the data gives you a very crisp way of analyzing whether or not the data, uh, the results that you get make sense and whether or not the patterns that you uncover uh, are semantically meaningful. Thank you very much.